I find it uh, very difficult to open my mouth and speak. <coughs> At one of the more tragic events in Chamisha uh, Pushei Torah, when Aaron Cohen, anticipating <coughs> many months, his great day of the completion of the Mishkan, his two dear sons die in front of his eyes. <coughs> and his response establishes Jewish response to tragedy. <coughs> Lanetzach, at least Ad Yomotam Mashiach. And that is Vayidom Aharon. And Aharon went silent. One does not have to be a very, very big thinker to understand. And I think these concepts are brought down. Vayidom, not just Vayidom of the mouth, Vayidom of the mind. Where his thoughts go silent. <clears throat> and when our thoughts go silent, silence of acceptance, which requires a lot of humility. <clears throat> that Aaron O'Cohen, we know from so many different directions, so deeply had. So then it's hard to open up one's mouth. And yet at the same time, we have a very big chiyuv, an obligation to try to understand God's world and God's ways to the extent that we're able to. And the way that we'll try to elaborate on the little time that we have now. On another level, I find it difficult to open up my mouth, and I think many people do. We've had many, many, many terrorist attacks in the past years, generations, earlier programs, many, many, many massacres. There's something about what happened this week, which I think for many people, for different reasons, threw things to a different level, to a new degree. It hooked very close. <coughs> in a neighborhood you would least expect English-speaking community, so familiar, so many people have some kind of a connection. <coughs> it's not East Yerushalayim, it's not the Old City, it's not Itamar and the Shomron, hard enough. <coughs> in the local shul of Bnei Torah, Tamidei Chachamim, Anashim Yirei Shamayim, in the middle of Tfilat Shmona Esle, for them to meet at the peak of a moment of the day, of complete Yirat Shamayim, Taharak, Dusha, to meet the complete other side. Literally, the dark side of the moon, of God's world. I, 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 can't, I can't say anything. But we have a few yes to say. <coughs> Yesterday and today, <coughs> different people in yeshiva, some students, some staff came over, I'm sure not just to me, but also to me, wanted to speak, wanted to hear, had questions. And during the developing of yesterday and today, I thought it would be fitting that there should be a place that, to share some thoughts on the matter. Usually this, this is this slot, I think it's the first time ever I'm speaking in this slot. It's defined as a mus Musar Shmuz slot. I don't know how to give a Musar Shmuz. I'm not a Bar Hachi to give Musar. I'm not trying to sound humble. I don't connect to the term, it's not me. I'm trying to share thoughts. What you do with the thoughts, that's for every person to decide. This morning, <clears throat> 9 o'clock in the morning, I went up the steps right here up to the Beit Midrash. And I saw my close, close friend and colleague here in Yeshiva that we all love so much, Rav Ami. And I didn't see him the day before and I didn't get to say Mazal Tov to him. I was too busy to call him. And I gave him a big hug. And as I'm hugging him and saying Mazal Tov, my eyes hop that up the steps somebody, and I appreciate that it was done, put up the pictures, the faces of the people who Hashem in Kom Damam Hakdoshim of this week. And I've been anticipating to see, just to see faces, to be able to some level connect. Maybe somehow I know them, I get to Harnof a lot. And this happened at the same moment. I'm giving a Rami a hug, Mazal Tov, Rami is beaming, and he has every right to, and he should, he should wife should continue beaming with many, many, many more Zemachot to come, including girls, Bezrat Hashem. I told him, not that I know much about it, but the Kabbalah, the seventh, has to do with a bchina of a nukba, of a female. So Bezrat Hashem, the next one will be a, a daughter. Amen. Bezrat Hashem. But in any case, 
It happens simultaneously. I see the pictures from far, and I'm giving Ravami a hug, and I'm experiencing it also tonight. Beautiful simcha that we have here, coming together with so many aspects of the beauty of the Aryeh, of one of my closest friends in yeshiva, outside of yeshiva, Rabbi Yol, with one of our dear Talmidim. A simcha also, beyond words, and at the same time, I hear, I, I'm rushing out of the porch in order to give a sicha about what I think is very, very important to address as a yeshiva. I often quote, I heard from an Adam Gadol here in Yerushalayim, that when you do something, le'ilui neshama, when you devote something to do le'ilui nishmat, it's only going to work, he said, if you who do it are going to get an ilui neshama yourself as a result. But if you're going to do something and your neshama here, and our world in Olam is not going to be elevated. As a result, you're not causing in the parallel world of Olam Ba'ba in Ilu Neshama. And I'd like to, of course, devote this sikha tonight to Ilu Nishmat, these four Kedoshim. And you know what? I'm not sure one can say this, but I have a, I have a need to say it, whether it's acceptable or not. I won't say Ilu Nishmat, but I'll say at least for the zchut of another human being not a Jew who is Moser Nefesh to save Jewish lives. And this evening is dedicated to him as well. But what I'd like to do, attempt for myself, and I'm going to try to share with whoever else would be able to relate to these words, to try to produce, not despite what happened in the Ilui Neshama for us, but because of what happened in the Ilui Neshama for us, and as a result, the Zat Hashem to devote it to the Ilui Nishmat, Kedoshim Hashem Yikom Dama. Let's begin. Parashat Shavua, Toldot. Please take your source sheet. Source number one. Now, for people who come regularly to our Chumashir, Chanal of people, for you people, this is a continuation of a lot of things we spoke about in the past few weeks. And for people who do not, it's an independent Sicha. It's, I try to design it in a way that it works for both. For the Chumash people, if there are elements which are repetitive for you, I apologize. Take it as uh, hopefully productive Chazar. Okay. Source number one, Pasuk Yutet in Bereshit, Parsha Toldot begins, Ve'ele Toldot Yitzchak, the last three lines in source number one, Ve'ele Toldot Yitzchak ben Abraham, Abraham olidet Yitzchak. We spoke about it in the Chumashir. Anybody who has a little logic in his head, and this, there's something very strange about this Pasuk, it's so incredibly circular. Ve'ele Toldot Yitzchak ben Abraham, Abraham olidet Yitzchak. But, if one wants to open up his eyes and to realize at least at the most basic shot level what's going on over here, one needs to go one step earlier and ask oneself, Me'ayin bata, to the beginning of Parsha Teila Todot. Me'ayin bata, from the end of Chayesara. What's the closing, Parshia? what's the closing piece of Parsha Chayesara? That which is line number one in source number one, and that is Ve'ele Todot Yishmael ben Abraham. A sensitive ear hears Compare and contrast. Ve'ele toldot Ishmael ben Abraham. Asher yalda hagar mitzchit shifchat sara Abraham. Compare and contrast to ve'ele toldot Yitzchak ben Abraham. Abraham only did Yitzchak. Meaning, it's impossible to understand the first pasuk of Parshat Toldot out of the context of, rel- of its relationship to the way Parshat Chayesara ended. Meaning, the switch from last week's Parsha to this week's Parsha, from Chayesara to Toldot, and this is a significant point which we're starting off with, is a comparison, if you wish, a clarification, a peru, between Yitzchak and Yishmael. <coughs> toldot Yitzchak, Toldot Yishmael, without going into definitions of Toldot right now, uh, it would take us out of our immediate discussion. Now, clarification between, and the choosing between, choosing, I'm saying, from the God's perspective, from history's perspective, as Sefer Bereshit is going through stage after stage of selecting, and we are at these weeks in the selection stage between Yishmael and Yitzchak, the question of selecting and clarifying between Yishmael and Yitzchak is constantly taking place in these parshiyot. We'll see two expressions of that. One is in uh, source number two, look inside, the Parsha Vayera, we recently read it. Uh, you need the wisdom of a good Jewish woman, and it goes much more deep and much more profound. However, even if we just say it as such, we need Sarah's eye to pick up as to where things are evolving into. Ezu Chachama, for the sake of this matter, Haro'ay Tanolad. And uh, she's able to tell 
based on what she sees in front of her eyes, the misbehavior and the misconduct of Yishmael, Vateres Sarai ben Agara Mitzrita sheyalda l'Abraham mitzachek. Vatomer l'Abraham, Garesh ha'ama azot ve'et bena, ki lo yirash bena ha'ama azot im bni mitzchak. And Abraham had a hard time with that, we all know that, etc, etc. And it continues. Source number three. Source number three, as we progress to the Akedah, the Psukim explicitly do not say that. You need the Ruach HaKodesh of Chazal to open up our eyes as to what's going on. Avram is going to the Akedah. At the end of Parsha Vayera, look inside source number three. וישכם אברהם בבוקר, ויחבוש את חמורו, ויקח את שני נעריו איתו, ואת יצחק בנו, ויבקע עצי עולה, ויקום וילך אל המקום אשר אמר לו אלוהים, the first time that we're going to reach the future site of Beit המקדש, right here, the first time that we get there. And the first time that we get there is described as such, אברהם comes with his חמור, we didn't have to say who he's coming with which exactly vehicle, and if he was coming with a Mercedes or a camel, it's irrelevant. It's relevant if we are telling us that he's coming with a chamor. Now let's see the extent of how relevant that is. So we're continuing. He sees the site, meaning the future Beit HaMikdash Mount. He sees it from far. How does he know that that is the mountain? Chazal teaches, Rashi brings it down. He sees the cloud of Shekhinah attached to the mountain. And he knows, oh, that's the place. I'm continuing on. This is the crux of it. Pasuk Hei, Vayomer Abraham el Ne'arav, he turns it to the Ne'arim, Chazal teach us, who are they? Yishmael and Eliezer. Shvu lachem po yim ha-chamor. Our good old chamor friend. Sit here with a chamor. V'ani v'ha-na'ar, a different na'ar, is referring of course to Yitzchak. Nelcha ad ko, interesting phrase, we won't focus on it right now. Nelcha ad ko, whatever that may mean. V'nishtachave, v'nashub alaychem. What's the meaning of these psukim? Chazal opened up our eyes to understand that Abram turns to Yitzchak and says, Yitzchak, do you see what I see? Yitzchak says, yes. Yishmael, do you see what I see? Eliezer, do you see what I see? They both say no. So Abram says, You need to be Chazal to pick up on it. The Torah did not have to say it in that fashion. Just wait for us. You need to be Chazal to understand the Torah's exact to the extent of every single word and every single letter. And that is, sit here with a chamor. You need Chazal's ear to tell us what's going on. Just like the chamor can see what's hovering over the mountain, so you cannot as well. The way Chazal bring it out, it sounds extremely not politically correct, I don't care, especially in a week like this week. And that is, Am Hadome Le Chamor. And I don't mind if these windows here are open, actually. Am Hadome Le Chamor. In the chamor, Chazal Darshan, and switch the punctuation, a people who resembles the chamor. That's Chazal's definition of Yishmael and Eliezer. Now, a thinker understands this is quite dramatic because the question is, Sefer Bereshit is busy checking out and clarifying who is suitable to go up to Haramoriyah <coughs> Who has a belonging to Har Habayit, to the future site of Beit HaMikdash? Who does not have a belonging to that place? Now why is it so relevant and why am I starting to speak loud? Because of the Ramban. What did the Ramban teach us? The Ramban quotes a line from, that actually appears in Chazal that most of us I think know and that sets the stage and defines the entire essence of all of Sefer Bereshit from the beginning to the end, and the Ramban has some of the most gigantic shoulders ever in history, ever, both in Halakha and in Kabbalah, of the earlier Kabbalah, the pre Arizal. And the Ramban teaches us, Sefer Bereshit, and it's an underlying theme in his entire parish of Sefer Bereshit. Sefer Bereshit given another title, Ma'aseh Avot Siman Lebanim, which means every detail in Sefer Bereshit in the book of Genesis, if you wish, is planting genes, seeds, prototype patterns for that which will unfold in history. And if it's not doing that in Sefer Bereshit, it cannot be, because that's what Sefer Bereshit is by definition. By essence, it's inherently so. Every detail that will appear in Sefer Bereshit is busy creating history. <coughs> that's the meaning of Sefer Bereshit called Sefer Yetzirah, in fact, in the Lashon of the Ramban because it's busy creating the building blocks of 
the entire course of history. Anything that, I'll say the other side of the coin is the same thing. Everything that will ever unfold <coughs> has to have had origins in Sefer Bereshit. And if it did not have origins in Sefer Bereshit, it can't be in history. That's the extent of the way the rule of Chazal, specifically the Ramban, comes out. Now why is this relevant? Because what this Ramban is saying, you who are Ben Avraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, you have a chiyuv, an obligation hovering over you to read Parsha Toldot every year as it switches from Parsha Chayi Sarah or the Chlaudi's Parshiot. And if Sefer Bereshit at this stage is clarifying between Yishmael and Yitzchak, and at the same time, Sefer Bereshit does nothing but defining the patterns of history. You have an obligation not just to make sure you don't sleep during laning. You have an obligation to try to figure out what is the Maaseh Avot Siman Banim over here. And in what way is the clarification between Yitzchak and Yishmael, we'll put Yitzchak from now on first of course, the clarification between Yitzchak and Yishmael, how does that manifest historically? And if you do not do that, you're not living up to being Yotze, the Chiyuv of reading every year, Sefer Bereshit. I don't think I'm exaggerating when I'm saying what I'm saying. With this background, let's see a fascinating, I think, Dati, an absolutely fascinating Gemara. Source number five. Look inside, please. Omerat Agmara in source number five, Vaisa Meshalo Vayomar. Oi mi yichye misumo el. Quote from Parshat Balak and Sefer Bamidbar. You have it, I, I photocopied it to the right of that same source, source number four. Ve'ata hineni olech le'ami, lecha yiyatzcha asher yase ha'am azel ha'amcha ve'acherit ha'yami. This is, those of you who remember Parshat Balak, the way it works, Bilam opens up his mouth three times to curse the Jewish people. Each time Hashem, Vayafoch Hashem Elokecha Lecha Et Aklala Livracha, Hashem turns the Klala into a Bracha, and then comes the fourth time. And this fourth time is special. Bilam doesn't ask for it, he knows already, yet. there's already, yet. even Balak understands the concept of Chazaka. And that's it, after three times it's not going to work anymore. And, but now Bilam says, I'm not asking you to invite me to speak, I'm going to speak now. On my own invitation, of course, a Kadosh Baruch invitation. And he starts speaking. And Chazal, not that I know much about it, but I do know what the sources at least say about it. These Psukim over here, from Pasuk Yudalid, and down further than what I just photocopied, a little more, contain the secrets, according to Chazal, of the way history is going to work, all the way to the end of days, specifically at the end of days. Mechem et Gog Magog, etc. are included within the Psukim. It's coming out, as surprising as it may be, and as strange as it may be, Dapta from the mouth of that Rasha, Bilam Rasha. In the context of that, skip down please with me, you'll see he's going through different nations and talking about their ultimate eternal fate, such as the classic, Vayaret Amalek Vayomar, you'll see it inside. Reshit Goim Amalek, Pasuk Kaf, Vacharito Adey Oved, you'll often hear it in coming to, when you come around Purim, you'll hear that Pasuk quoted a lot. And then, if you skip to the last line of source number four, that's the pasuk that the Gemara Masechet Sanhedrin is going to quote. Vayisame shalom vayomar, oy mi yichye mi sumo el. Strange sounding pasuk. Can't understand just at face value what this pasuk saying. What Hashem is saying, if you wish, through the mouth of Bilam. Says the Gemara Masechet Sanhedrin in the long sugiyot, if you may f be familiar, of Ikvet HaDemashicha, long, long agadatas, one daf after another after another, loaded with information as to the nature of Ikvet HaDemashicha, what I think all Jews, regardless of the color of their kippah, agree that we're there. It's other titles or definitions that people will fall into arguments as to whether they accept it or not. And too bad that people waste so much time on arguing on those definitions. But Ikvata the Mashiach, everybody agrees that we're there. You'll hear it from so many different sources uh, earlier than our generation, for sure in our generation. And the context of that, here the Gemara says like this. There's the round brackets over here. We'll read it anyways. <coughs> Amav Rishlakish Oi Mishemechaye Atzmo Deshem El. Oi for he who keeps himself alive or draws his life from the Shem Kel. 
Not so clear. Putting it aside. Kedana bear it in mind as we go on. The Gemara continues. I'm Rabbi Yochanan. What does that mean? I'll tell you what it means. Oi, we all know what oi means. Oi, la la uma. Oi to that nation. Oi to that power in the world, Shetimatse, that it will be found the Sha'a Shakadosh Bahu Ose Pidion Lebanal. Oi to the nation that will be found at the time when Hashem is busy redeeming his children. <coughs> Continues the Gemara and gives the following mashal. Mi matin, meaning who has the guts? Who would dare matil ksuto? Who would dare put a garment, a barrier between the lion and the lioness? Bet navi leleviya b'sha'ashin is kakim zein zeh. When the lion and the lioness come together to mate, who would be the fool and who would have the guts to put a barrier or a garment between them? That is the mashal that when a kadosh at the end of days will we be busy regathering his children? and will be redeeming his children over a process, oi, there will be an oi to that nation. We're warning it. It's going to pay its price at the end for putting a barrier between HaKadosh Baruch Hu and the people of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the children of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, at the end of days when God is busy redeeming them. Look at Rashi, basically he explains it. The Rashi just below. Oi la la uma Oi la la uma shetihiye b'otan ayamim. Oi to that nation that will be there at the end of days. In those days, I'm sorry. In those days, sheyaleh adata that will have the hava mina leakev Yisrael to prevent Klal Yisrael from coming together back with Hakadosh Baruch Hu. The Gemara, a Gemara sotemet. The Gemara does not tell us which uma, what nation, which power in the world this actually is. <coughs> Before we move on, and before we try to possibly see what nation actually Chazal are maybe hinting here towards, let's give a little more background. And a little more background is the following. Turn the page, please. And source number six, what we find over here, back in Parsha Lech Lecha, <coughs> is the famous one of, or the first of two britot that Hashem koret im Avraham Avinu beparashat Lech Lecha. This is not Brit Mila, this is Brit Bene Betarim. Quickly, we'll do this, we're running out of time. Brit Bene Betarim works as follows. Hashem promises Avram Avinu a child, and Avram believes HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and he gets credit for that. And Hashem continues and promises him the land of Israel. And Avram says, How do I know that I will in fact inherit the land? There's a seemingly surprising discrepancy between his responses. <clears throat> the way Mefarshim explained it, and even our Talmudim came up with it on their own, I must say, in our Chumash year, the other week, and that is, the difference is, it doesn't matter that it's against all the laws of biology, physiology, and fertility. If God promises me a child, He invented those laws, He will give me a child. But the land of Israel, Abraham Avinu already understands, you don't just receive, you receive to the extent that you merit it. You have to live up to certain standards in order to receive the land. We read it Yom Kippur afternoon. If we live by the laws of relationships, the abominations of Mitzrayim and Canaan, we get to be vomited out of the land. It's not my words. It's the harsh words of Parshat Akhrein Lot. We read it Yom Kippur afternoon. It's an example. And that's been proven over and over throughout history. The Jewish people don't live up to the breach with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. The land of breach throws us out. And we go out to Galut. So Avram says, I, I can't take responsibility for my children. I'm not going to be around anymore. I'm going to be buried in Marat HaMachpila. And my children may live in a way that they don't merit Eretz Yisrael. So I don't know that Eretz Yisrael will be mine. Hashem responds with Brit Ben Abitarim. Now please listen carefully. What does that mean? So Hashem says to him, take these four species, slice them in half, hence Ben Abitarim, walk between them, not going into all the details, and their fifth species, and that is the dove or the bird, the gozal. Don't slice it, keep it whole at the end. And that is my promise to you. Your children are going to go down to be persecuted by a people, Mitzrayim, of course, even though the person doesn't say so. And they will be there for a long time until I take them out and they'll become a people as a result. <laughs> Basically tells them about Galut Mitzrayim and they're coming out of Mitzrayim, Yitzhia Mitzrayim. Chazal will tell us, what's going on? What are these four species? What's the dove or the bird? They're sliced, he's not sliced, Mazen. What does that got to do with anything? 
you need, again, Chazal Zayz, and what Chazal teaches is nothing less than the following, that Hashem is revealing here to Avram Avinu, says Madrash Rabbah and other Midrashim, I think, as well, nothing less than the historical pattern of the Jewish people from beginning to the end of days. And these four species, first secrets, which are beyond, at least me, <coughs> represent each one in their turn, one of the world powers that will take over the world, rule over it, take over Klal Yisrael, exile Klal Yisrael, and Chrysler is going to have to be under their ruling and their exile. The first of the species is relating to the power of Babel, the Babylonian world power. World power that means taking over the entire world. Going on to the Persians and the Palas Madai, during which the story of Purim takes place. Going on to the Greeks, Hanukkah coming up soon. And going on finally to Galut Edom. <clears throat> the Roman Empire that turns into the Christian world, that Western world, that rules over the world, according to Chazal, at least, all the way to the days of uh, Yomot HaMashiach. <clears throat> so much so, is this the pattern? It's based on the prophecies, by the way, of Daniel, Sefer Daniel. <clears throat> and it's embedded already in the beginning of Maaseh Bereshit, V'aretz ha'ita tohu v'avohu v'choshech atnei tehom, V'ruach Elohim nerachefet al pnei amayim, Say Chazal, each of those terms, Tohu, Vohu, Choshech, and Tehom, refers to these four exiles. The entire pattern history of the Jewish people in the very origins of Sefer Bereshit. The slicing of these animals means the Jewish people, your children, Avram, are going to slice through these world powers, which each one in their turn will turn into the dust of history. And the bird representing Kaisal will remain intact and whole all the way to the end of the days. And that's the secret. You're afraid that your children are going to go after Derech? So fine. They're not fine, but fine. So they're going to, they'll be exiled. And they'll learn their hard way, stage after stage. They'll have to go through another exile to clarify themselves, to learn from their mistakes. And then they'll come back there with this one. And then they'll go again out to another exile until they go through each stage, cleanse, fix, correct each and every one of their mistakes, each generation and their issues, so that by the end of days they'll be able to come back to the land of Israel and hopefully we're at that stage and be able to merit Eretz Yisrael for eternity. And that's what Hashem's response is. There's no voodoo here, there's nothing strange. It's the entire course of the history of the Jewish people from beginning to the end of days, nothing less dramatic than that is what Brit Beit Petarim is about. We're cutting here, we're making, we're signing a deal over history. That's the point. We're going through history together. Me, God, he says of course, and you, the Jewish people, we're going through history together. I can't work without you, you can't work without me. If you have a philosophical problem with what I just said, you're welcome to come to me personally afterwards. I can't, I'll repeat it again, work without you. That's the way Hashem chose for His world to work. You can't work without me. We're going to journey through this together. Not stand that we so often compare our relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu to that of marriage. We're going to journey through life, but now it's the macrocosmic life. Marriage of history together. Or whatever that may mean. However that long that may take, and I'll always be where there with you. And it's Moshe Rabbeinu later on Parsha Kiti said and insisted that it would be so. You don't go without us. We're not going to go without you. Don't send an angel. We're together in it. I always quote the famous words of Rabbi Yaakov Emdin. Rabbi Yaakov Emdin was one of the leaders of Klal Yisrael a few hundred years ago. And in his famous introduction to his Sidu, Bet Yaakov, I think they probably have it here in the library, he says the following words. Had I stood at Kriyat Yamsuf, says this big Gadol of Klal Yisrael. Had I stood at Kriyat Yamsuf, Kriyat Yamsuf would not be as big as a testimony for the truth of Torah and for Mitziyut Hashem as the ongoing existence of the Jewish people throughout the ages, despite all attempts to demolish them, that's a greater manifestation and testimony for God's ruling over the world more so than Kriyat Yamsuf itself. Those are his words. And you can hear in the background, possibly, the words of the Rambam in Hilchot Yesodei Torah, that he whose belief in God is based on miracles there's something off in his emuna if it's off miracles. I'll add, in our emuna seminar day, we'll talk about it more. Today we'll call that thing proofs. He who believes in God based on proofs, says the Rambam, 
I'm allowing myself to make that equation. You don't have to accept it. I'll claim so. And I'll add, or al piha hochachot, borrowed from scientific terminology. Yes, belibod dofi. Rabbi Yaakov Emden said, I don't look for proofs. I'm gazing at history. And I'm looking back at hundreds and thousands of years. And me, like you in the future, and other Jews in the past, sit once a year, Seder night, and say, Is this an interpretation of history? Okay, yes. Is this reality? Every Jew needs to decide for himself. Is this proven to, by history? Does history testify that there's nothing to history other than God that rules over it? Taking the Jewish people from Yitziat Mitzrayim, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, century after century, all the way to Achrit HaYamim. One process, starting in Yitziat Mitzrayim, ending in Yamot HaMashiach, ongoing God's ruling over the world, taking Klai Yisrael to that place. Rev. Yaakov Emden, he opens up his eyes. The story of the Jewish people throughout history is the ultimate expression, manifestation, and testimony of that. As to each and every one of us, we need to listen to the testimony and say, we accept it or not. That's already cheshbon that each person has with himself and with God. If he does exist, I happen to think that he does exist. These issues are as a chiyuv as can be on a Jew to reflect upon. No less, I always say, than a chiyuv of putting on tefillin in the morning. No less than putting on tzitzit. No less than keeping Shabbat. How do I know? Moshe Rabbeinu told us in his closing words in Parshat Azinu, some older guys here say that's my pasuk. Said if there's such a thing as my pasuk. Source number eight. Just one pasuk from Parashat Azinu, the story, or the song in fact, of the history of the Jewish people from beginning to end, not might, what might be, rather that which will be. The Rambam dealt with it in terms of its supposable seemingly contradiction to freedom of choice. Philosophers here, you're invited to come, we can discuss it in another opportunity. But, says source number eight, Zichor Yemot Olam, I command you, to reflect, to remember the days of the world. Binu, try to understand the years of Do Vado. This is an obligation. You'll tell me it doesn't come out to be written in Taryag Mitzvot and Sefer Chinuch or in any other of the. I agree with you. How to formulate it exactly? We have thumbs, Baruch Hashem, we can use them. How exactly to explain how and what category it is exactly. But the shot of the words is as simple as can be. You have a chiyuv to reflect upon the patterns of history. And if you don't do that, you might be missing out, I'm adding those words, on the very bottom line of Kola Torah Kula. I know these are daring words, I'm allowing myself to say that. You want to argue? You can argue. This comes at the closing words of Moshe Rabbeinu. The next parsha down, parsha Zotah Bracha, Moshe Rabbeinu is giving out brachot. The last teachings of Torah is Shirat Azinu. And for thinkers over here, beware the fact, some of you may be aware of that already, you can't separate HaTorah, Ketorah, from the Shira of Azinu. They're equivalent to each other. Because I'm saying this in brackets for people who know and understand what I'm talking about. Which Shatwise is talking about the Shira of Azinu becomes, yes, a mitzvah. Mitayag mitzvot to write a Sefer Torah. Sefer Torah, we're talking about Shirat Azinu. Mm, maybe there's an equation over there. Either way, we have a chiyuv to reflect upon our history. And if we do, we may come to see the ultimate testimonies for God's ruling over the world. And if we may not, we may be missing out on the very bottom line of it. How does it relate to everything we're talking about? It relates as such. <clears throat> Look inside, please. Source number nine, source number ten. The Gemara in Masechet Sanhedrin, which we saw before, does not teach us what is that power in the world, what is that nation in the world that will attempt to prevent Kla Yisrael at the end of days by, of being redeemed by HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That nation that will put a barrier between the lion and the lioness. Oi to that people, oi to that nation. The Gemara does not tell us I believe the Medrash does. Look inside. <clears throat> Let's start off, in fact, with um, source number 10. Pirkei de Rablezer. Midrash Pirkei de Rablezer, 
very interesting medrash. We have it in the library. Not easy, not hard to understand. Not like Medrash Shabbat. It's very easy flow. Highly recommended to look at. Amar Bilam. This is going on our pasuk. Oy mi yichye mi sumo el. Oy mi yichye mi sumo el. Says the Medrash. Amar Bilam. Mi shivim leshonot shebara kadosh baruch hu ba'olamo. Of the 70 languages, nations that is. That HaKadosh Baruch Hu created in His word. Lo sam shmo lechad meim elel Yisrael. Hashem put His name. Shem kel only in one people. Yisrael. Ho'il, however, v'yishva kadosh baruch hu. Shmo shel Yishmael. Le shmo shel Yisrael. He equated on some level Yishmael to Yisrael because he also put his name El there in the Shem Yishmael. Oy, therefore, oy mi yichye b'yamav. Oy, who will be able to live in his days? What does it mean, live in his days? Sh'neemav, oy mi yichye misumo El. Meadrash Ferret and the Rebbe Lezer opens up our eyes to that which the Gemara and Sanhedrin covers up, and I suspect that they do go hand in hand together. It's just that the Gemara hides that which the Medrash, and it often happens, opens up and reveals to us that it's referring to the people of Yishmael. Rabbi Ishmael, of all people, I always find that interesting. Rabbi Ishmael Omer, 15 things are the children of Ishmael, are future to do in the land of Israel at the end of days. There's a whole long list over here, very thought-provoking. We don't have the time to go through all of them. I'll just mention one or two. One of them is quite amazing historically. They will turn the graveyards of Jews into garbage dumps. We know exactly what was found in Haraz Zetim and in other places after 67 war, when we got there after many, many years. <clears throat> they will build, according to some shots at least, their own temple on the Temple Mount. The Medrash continues and says, <clears throat> I'm skipping to the second column, to the left. In those days, of Bnei Ishmael taking over the ruling in the world and specifically in Eretz Israel, Yamod Tzemach ben David. Tzemach ben David, Mashiach ben David, will come as a result of all that. Skip two lines. We don't have time to see everything inside. Three wars of chaos. Atidin Bnei Ishmael asot ba'aretz. Be'achrit amim. Three wars are Bnei Ishmael future to do in the land of Israel at the end of days. Sheneemar, etc. Skip together with me down below. Misham ben David Yitzmach v'yivre v'yirei b'ovdan shel elu v'elu, etc., etc., etc. Another source, source uh, number nine, another pirk of the Rabbi Lezer, uh, one pirk further. The Gemara Medjish here claims, why is Ishmael called Ishmael? A, a different twist. V'karat shmo Ishmael, v'lama nikra shmo Ishmael? Sh'atid ha-kadosh baruchu, l'ishmoa v'kol na'akat ha'am m'ma sh'atidim b'nei Ishmael ha'asot ba'aretz v'acharit ha'yamim. Yishmael, look how reverse that is. Yishmael is called Yishmael because Hashem, at the end of days, is future to listen. Hashem is future to listen. Yishmael, the kol na'akat the screams, the crying of Bnei Israel because of what Bnei Yishmael are going to do to Bnei Israel and Eretz Israel ba'achrit ha'yamim. Okay? All this leads to the following. And this finds significant support in Talmudei Arizal, sources in the Zohar that talk about it as well. And that is, even though Brit Ben Abitarim spoke about, according to Chazal, the four world powers that rule over the world, and the last one being Galut Adom, which will finally end with Yimot HaMashiach, Chazal opened up our eyes to realize that at the end of Galut Adom, there will be another Galut. And that's the way Talmudei Ari and other sources refer to it as Galut Yishmael. Galut Yishmael, another Galut in Eretz Yisrael, as these Midrashim allude to, where Yishmael is going to take control over part of the land. The Zohar says that its merit is its Brit Milah, which is a prerequisite for the land of Israel. He has a Brit Milah. He has some kind of a limited control over the land. Obviously, this goes into deep secrets. What does that mean? But in any case, <clears throat> this is what Chazal say. Go on for just a few more minutes. <clears throat> The question that Sefer Bereshit is busy clarifying. Yishmael versus Yitzchak. And we said that the Ramban tells us you have an obligation to reflect upon. Where does that clarification manifest itself historically? <coughs> Klal Yisrael and Bnei Yishmael have a war today over this mountain, over Beit HaMikdash. And Avram keeps screaming throughout history. And the echo continues till this very day. Sit here, you are an Am HaDomele Chamo. That place doesn't belong to you. And therefore, what we see in front of our eyes, the truth of the matter is, 
if we were on the proper level, every single time we walk through the Koto Plaza and see what's there, we really should feel that we want to excuse my language to vomit. I'm sure that's what Avraham Ravina would say. Because he really doesn't have any belonging to that place. He is a chamo. He resembles the chamo. Should I tell you what I think the pshat is? I can tell you what I think. Uh, Yishma has 50% of his genes are from Avram Avinu, the, the person who brings Emunah into the world. Yishma has very strong Emunah. I remember a few times in JFK seeing Jews just before Shkia going into a telephone booth. Do they still have those such things? I don't know. But uh, it's a David Mincha. But an Arab puts down his mat in front of everybody. Does anybody boo shy? He's davening. But he has another set of genes. 50% from Hagal. Ham Mitzrit. From Mitzrayim. The son of Ham. Who we know did not obey the laws of the Mabul. Who was not cleansed by the Mabul. And we know what he did with his father after the Mabul. And we know how he ruins God's sniyut of God's world. And his son is Mitzrayim, who together with Knan define Arayot on Yom Kippur afternoon. We just read it as I said before. So 50% is coming from Mitzrayim. So when you join the two together, what does it look like? It looks like somebody who on the one hand has tremendous Emunah. And he'll sacrifice his life, as we heard this week, screaming his name in a Shulon Arnof. And what he's convinced is that he goes up and he gets a Gan Eden of Mitzrayim. He's convinced that his great-grandfather's fantasies of an adolescent are going to be finally fulfilled in his warped concept of heaven. And that's what we deal with today. And it comes out in so many different ways. And we sense so deeply this past week, people, as we said in the beginning, in the middle of Tminat Shmona at a moment of intense Yirat Shamayim, Tahara, Kedusha, people, Talmidei Chachamim, Imidot Tovot, try! We're not perfect! Try to devote their life to good, good deeds in God's world. To teach Torah during the week, to give out food on the Erev of Shabbat. We heard about Rav Tversky. Hashem yimkom demo zecher tzadik lebracha. And at that moment, to be attacked, the primitive is not low enough of a word. Barbaric is not a, a low enough of a word. No words are legitimate. And therefore, always the words of politicians here, from everywhere in the world, seem so empty, cheap, in response. But a Ben Yisrael, a Ben Torah, Ben Tfilah, that understands somewhat what is the inside world of Yirat Shamaim, of Tahara, of Kedusha, of Midot Tovot, of Gemilut Chasadim, of Tfilat Shmona Esre, the Kavana, of a person who just wants to do good in God's world, and that's all that he wants. At that moment, to meet the face of cruel hate on the most primitive form that you think is no longer in our world, we're advanced, we have computers, we're so... And all of a sudden the world of primitive man comes back in the ugliest of faces. You know what? Uglier than ever in the past. Why? Because Ishmael is part of Shem. That means, you want to know what Ham looks like when he reappears in Shem? That's exactly these people. That's Ham in the tents of Shem. And that's what makes it so deeply ugly. Because they are part of this modern world today, supposedly. And they're a monotheistic religion. And it's not one or two. And I'm not here to dismiss every single person that is a Muslim. Absolutely not. And there are very right-wing people in this room who dismiss my words, so we'll have to agree that we disagree. I personally know such people. You want to argue with me? Yeah, but you turn the back, they'll put a knife in your back. I don't accept it. I'll prove it to you. Chazal say, Yishmael at the end of his day did tshuva. But there are too many, thousands and millions of Bnei Yishmael who live in a sick, 
warped, primitive world of cruelty and fantasy. <laughs> Why is it important to know all this? Why is it so important for me to share, for those who at least don't know, I'm sure older people here are familiar with these sources, but for people who don't know, why is it so crucial? And the truth of the matter is, I must be honest, I, I, for years already I sensed that there are even many Talmidei Chachamim, much, much bigger than little Amos Lubin. I'm not trying to sound humble, much bigger. They just, they don't think in these terms. They're not aware of such sources, which are totally available. This is not some kind of a far out, who knows, the czar from... These are Midrashim, Gmarot. We just have to open up such sources to be interested in it. Why does it make so much of a difference? It makes all the difference in the world in my eyes. And if I had any doubt about it, so in a very interesting and painful conversation that I had with one of the dearer people that recently joined our yeshiva, or Shlomo Creditor, who of everybody in the Shiva, from what I know, was closest to the event and was, testifies and was at the site and knew the people and told me, and I asked him to shoot just before it began if I can share those, this is our conversation. We're sitting in the, we were in the, standing in the library talking about these concepts and the Shlomo said, I, just, I can't tell you, my, my whole life is completely shaken up. And he put it in the, most, in the best terms. A human being, especially in our generation, growing up in the Western comfortable world, thinks life is meant to go in a certain path, track, and all of a sudden, you're hit with such intensity that it shakes up the whole basis of your entire life. And all of a sudden, you start thinking, maybe life has a completely different track to it. Maybe a Kadosh Baruch Hu is trying to open up your eyes. Life is completely different than what you so deeply, or your society so deeply, even from society, convince yourself that it is. I beg every person to take Shlomo's words, or Shlomo's words, to deeply, deeply to heart. Especially Shana Bet, Shana Gimana, all the people. I think that might be a little challenging for some Shana Aleph people. In general, I wasn't sure whether it's suitable so much to Sikha for Shana Aleph people. Because the outcome of what we're saying, and I'll conclude with this. <clears throat> and this is what I'll share also with Rosh Shlomo. Last Shabbat, we summed up Sarah's life as being eternally defined. <coughs> as Me'arat HaMachpelah. I'm sure these things are brought down. Different versions, different styles. <coughs> Defining her and our life as Nachpela, as a double life that takes place in two worlds simultaneously. And hovering above it is another floor, just like Narata Nachpela, another life. Two lives, and now there are many different levels, and one can understand it. And the level that Shlomo and I spoke about is as following what we see from all the sources we saw this evening. God's master plan that's unfolding. Not every now and then. And the Ramchal and Dat Vunot, for those familiar, drives it in very, very well. Every single day, from Yitziat Mitzrayim, Ad Etzem Ayom Azeh, and Ad Biat Mashiach Tzidkenu Bimera Biyameinu, every single day, God is busy pulling the strings of history, sometimes in ways which are more apparent, and sometimes in ways which are completely not apparent. But every single day is he busy pulling the world and the Jewish people on the centerpiece of it to its destination. At every single stage, Galakla Yisrael is going to have to clarify itself, its identity, and the contrasting background of another people, another world power. Once pagans, and then a whole new world. We're coming up soon to Hanukkah, Greeks, a new challenge. Jews like to think. Jews appreciate beauty. Beauty Jews appreciate depth, philosophy, new challenges. You have to clarify yourself and identify and define yourself in ways that you did not have to in the past. Implications still today, every time a good Jew walks onto a college campus, you're dealing with the Greeks and their imprint on the world. If I paraphrase Chazal. Every generation with its clarifications. But I need that's part of God's rules, laws of history. You need always an opposing force to clash with, 
through which you can define yourself. That's the meaning of a, a world of etzada tovera. You need ra for tov to define himself, and vice versa. You can't work without opposites. You cannot become. For example, I always bring this example. Yosef at Sadiq owes his title Sadiq to Ashit Potiphar. If not for her, he would never become Yosef at Sadiq. So it would be another Ashit Potiphar, but there needs to be an Ashit Potiphar to put him in a place that otherwise he wouldn't reach that clarification which would lead him to become Yosef at Sadiq. And one can also fail these tests and clarifications. After all the process, there will be one more clarification. But from what seems from our sources, inside Eretz Yisrael, which we're getting to see and experience year after year with another force in the world, they're not a world power. I don't think they Bechal deserve to be referred to as a Malchut. They're so not noble in their ways, in their accent, and their demeanor. They don't deserve to be a Malchut. They're a Ama Domele Chamo. A lion may be compared <clears throat> to Malchut, not a chamo. At the end of days, just before Mashiach comes, that's what the sources say. It's up to every person to say, accept, accept these words of Chazal. Don't accept these words of Chazal. It's an avod of every person with himself, between him, himself, HaKadosh Baruch and Chazal. At the end of days, before Mashiach comes, when Kaisa is gathering back, when Hashem is busy redeeming His children, a process. There will be a people that will put a barrier between a lion and a lioness. Yeah, these are animals that represent Malchut, true Malchut in the world, Malchut Melech HaMashiach. Oi to that people! And we should be able to say that every time we see one of them <clears throat> trying to attack us. Oi! Mi yichye mi sumo. Oi, I'm telling you, you're going to pay the price. People have been asking me about what is the meaning. Ben came to me today also. Of Hashem taking revenge at the end of days. I can't develop it too much. I'm not claiming to fully understand it, not even partially. But Hashem will take revenge at the end of days. And Hashem tells them, Oi! You're going to pay your price. Everybody's going to pay their price. And they're going to pay their price as well. Why is this so important to know? Because it puts all of our life here in Olam Hazeh in a completely different context. That's why. And that's the words of Rabbi Shlomo Creditor this morning. You come to realize that our life is double. There is my daily life where I do wonderful things. I learn, I try to work on my midot. It's taking place on the Lama in changing moments and hours of the day. And my life for the next few years. And my 70 years or 80 or 90 years of life. And then there's a whole other layer hovering above. Machpela, another layer that most people are, are not aware of. And don't realize there's another layer, another realm. And that's God's historical master plan that's busy unfolding every single day. For all the people here who want to develop these concepts, you have to learn Sefer Dat Vunot of Ramchal. All the people here heard that many times from me. That will be the Sefer that most clarifies stage after stage these concepts. <clears throat> and, and in many ways, it's completely in the background of everything that we're talking about this evening. And when we are get overly immersed in the first realm, and we live only in the first floor, we Jews can't have that luxury of living only in one floor. You need to live in a two floors. And when you do live only in one floor, when we do that, Hashem shakes up our first floor. And that's why Jews always have it more challenging in this world. And we had it all throughout the ages. It's just as Rabbi Shlomo said this morning, correct, in our generation, we don't, we're not already, you know, the history. The Holocaust belongs to history. Programs belong to history. Massacres belong to history. No, Tampat belongs to history. This is already a different day and age. Jews in Germany also thought so, of course. This is a different day and age. We're modern, we have technology, we have computers, everything is completely different. We don't see blood, we're good. The world is more or less okay, and it will continue being okay like this for Ad Netzach Netzachim. And when we fall into that place, every person in his own way, which is a dusty place, which is, can be even a moldy place and an unhealthy place, Hashem shakes up our world to force us to realize I'm cracking up first floor. To, only for you to open up your eyes, there's something much bigger happening in life than just your own private story. Your private story is precious and important. But it must be seen in a broader context. We'll end on the following note. When a person knows that what happened this past week it's not just a local tragic event. It's been going on for weeks. 
in Yerushalayim. And it's been going on for years, and it's been going on for decades, and centuries, and in a broader sense, it's been going on ever since we came out of, the day we came out of Yitzhak Mitzrayim. And it never ended. And the Chaldol Vadol Omdim Aleinu Lechalotainu. And we get to see time and again, they're gone from the face of the earth. V'akadosh Baruch Hu Matzileinu Miyadam. Yishmael's fate is going to be the same one as the one from, I'm not going to mention his name here in our holy Bet Midrash from 70 years ago. The same fate is going to come to them. But we're in the midst of the process now. And, but a Jew has a chiv to open up his eyes and not to be overly shaken, to be in total pain over what happened this week, recent weeks, earlier in the summer. In pain, yes. Chas v'chalila depression not. Chas v'shalom to go into a place of low. On the contrary. And that's the ilu'i neshama that I was talking about at the beginning. One has to come out of such a week when one's neshama is elevated. In pain and elevated. And they don't contradict. And that's why ultimately me, I'm able to hug Ravami and say mazal tov to him as we said in the beginning. And at the same time see the faces of uh, the nirtzachim Hashem imkom damam. And they coexist. And they completely coexist as this sicha and Rabiel's beautiful engagement on the porch as we're speaking and hearing in the background. For Jews, they coexist. <coughs> Not separately, they coexist. Because together they make our life meaningful. And the meaningfulness of our life has so many different shades to it. But the most important thing is when I realize these sources, everything falls into a certain <coughs> sensible, meaningful context. It's not a random world. Things just don't happen in a totally tragic, cruel way. It's cruel. It's tragic. But it's part of a master plan. We don't understand the morals of God. But we have a chiv to try to understand whatever we could in terms of the way He rules over His world. When a person internalizes such concepts, he can walk around the world not confused and not overly troubled and not even overly afraid. He can walk around the world with might with pride that Hashem selected him and his friends to be members in this elite unit called Klal Yisrael. Few, very few, get to be in this closed club. Closed, get open. If you're really like Ruta Moabiyah, you can join. And if not, not. But it's a closed club for people who merit to be in this unit. And to have that sense when you walk around the world, a world of meaningfulness, a world of the most meaningfulness possible that draws from the meaning of nothing less than all of history. A Jew who starts thinking along these lines when everywhere he goes and ultimately in every moment of any little day he realizes there is no such thing as a little day because he always has thousands of years of history hovering over his shoulders and influencing and infusing every moment of his day and his life and his marriage and his relationship with his kids and his Shabbat conversations at the Shabbos table, I'm not talking about the next, and not about the latest BMW. I'm talking about God's world, which is gorgeous, and full of meaning, and full of purpose, and life transforming, and sometimes painful, but the pain doesn't put me down. Even the pain puts me up. And as a result, I can come out of such a week with an elevation to my soul. Bezat Hashem, it should be an elevation to the four souls that went up.